So hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Rashida L. Weaver, and this is the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Practice and Mindset class. Today, we have a wonderful speaker named Renee Brinkley, and I'll tell you a little bit about her before she gets started with her talk. All right, so Renee Brinkley is a strategic marketing leader with a passion for storytelling. She uses the power of a story to generate creative and strategic marketing solutions that connect people to global brands. She has worked as a producer for CNN and as a brand marketer for CNBC for shows like Shark Tank and The Profit, shows you love. <laughs> um, Renee brings stories to life as a creative cross-platform marketing campaigns that increase brand awareness and promote customer loyalty. She applies her diverse background in entertainment marketing and broadcast media to craft narratives that leverage consumer insights and influence audience behavior. She is an innovative problem solver with a reputation for thriving in collaborative, high energy environments. She is also one of the most wonderful people I know. So welcome to our class, Renee Brinkley. She has such a great energy. So <laughs> a virtual round of applause. <laughs> welcome, welcome. I was just saying that I'm very excited to be here and to kind of go through this presentation with all of you. So I put together um, a PowerPoint presentation and I'll walk you guys through that when I'm done, we can um, do Q and A's and you can ask me any kind of questions. You can also raise your hand if there's something that I'm saying throughout the presentation you want cl further clarification on, but uh, but we'll probably use like the first half to kind of go through the presentation. And then after that, you know, you guys can kind of go at it and ask me, you know, whatever's on your mind about branding and marketing and storytelling. Sounds good? Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do is share my screen. So hold on, let me do that. So I think, okay, so you guys should see my, oh, I mean, you should see my screen, right? And oops, I don't want you to see that. Don't take that away. Okay, so I think you should see my document that says building your brand through storytelling. Is that this, uh, Rashid? Is that what what you see? I just want to make sure before I kind of launch into it. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, so what we're going to talk about is how to build your brand. Um, through storytelling. So it should be hopefully a thought provoking conversation. So what we're going to discuss today is first, what is storytelling? Um, then why storytelling works from a brand perspective. And then I wanna give you some tools to help you find your, your entrepreneur story and then give you tools on how to tell your story and then kind of wrap up with how to make the media work for you. So that's kind of the, 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 what we're going to be walking through. But first, I'll tell you a, a little bit more about me or why I do what I do. So I think, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, well, what do you do when you just say, oh, I'm, you know, a student and I own a college or whatever, but you're also much more than, you know, whatever your job title says you are. So um, the way I look at why I do what I do is because I think that the world can be, you know, an overwhelming place. It's like, what do I buy? What do I watch? What do I do? What do I wear? Where do I go? What do I believe? And, and I think that what I, I see my role as helping people kind of connect to each other by telling stories as a journalist and also as a marketer, because fundamentally both of those roles are about storytelling and connecting people. So that's why I do what I do. And so I like this one quote here um, about storytelling, um, that those who tell the stories uh, rule the world. So you might be asking, do I rule the world? Well, not quite, but I do think that storytellers um, have a powerful role in shaping how we kind of view the world. And because stories ultimately influence our behavior, 
Um, stories, as, as all of you know, um, stories can make us laugh, they can make us cry, they can make us angry, they can make us sympathetic, they can make us care about something. Um, and they also kind of connect us with other people. And they also kind of help build relationships. So when you think about it, when you first meet someone, you know, you're at like a, a bar, a party, what have you, you meet a stranger, the first thing you try and do is find out more about their story. You tell them about who you are. You find out, you know, where they're from. What do they do? What do they like? And he's like, oh my God, you went to Iowa College, so did I. Or, oh, you're from New Jersey or New York. Oh, so am I. So you always try and find, use your, use your story um, to try and find something in common with someone else as a way of kind of building that relationship with that person. Like, what do we have in common and how can we kind of move forward together? So that's really the, the power that kind of lies in a story that we, and we each tell Tell stories every single day. And as a brand, we also should be telling stories and thinking about how to create some sort of competitive advantage for our brand through storytelling. So one day you can use your story to try and rule the world that you, you occupy, whether that's the technology world, the fashion world, whatever world that your idea um, exists in. Okay, so the first thing is what is storytelling? And so we're gonna start by telling you what storytelling is, is by telling you a rooftop wine story. So um, this is a story that I wrote for CNBC um, a couple of years ago, and it is about a rooftop winery in Brooklyn. And so there was an, there is an entrepreneur there, his name is Devin Shoemaker, and he was actually a student studying viticulture, you know, the, the art of making wine in upstate New York. And so I picked the story because he was a student just like all of you. He had an idea just like all of you. And he actually launched this business um, while he was actually in while he was still a student, which I think is actually pretty cool. So while he was a student studying viticulture, he had this idea that he really wanted to open up um, an urban winery. And a couple of years ago, urban wineries were really kind of all the rage. I mean, you had, um, you know, uh, Brooklyn Winery, you know, there's several wineries in New York and in, across like, you know, urban cities that became very popular. So, but the idea of urban wineries is that they have the production facilities for actually making the wine will be in the urban environment, but they would source the grapes would really be coming from a, a wine, uh, a uh, wine making region, right? So you wouldn't necessarily, you may go upstate New York in the Finger Lakes and where they have a lot, where they make wine and source your grapes from there, bring those back to New York City and where you have a facility to actually turn those grapes into wine. So that's basically the model because obviously there are no vineyards, you know, in Brooklyn or any of these other cities where you have in these urban environments. But Devin's idea was to say, well, why not? Um, you know, why not just kind of create, have a Brooklyn vine, makes Brooklyn wine and not even import your grapes from upstate or, or from California or from wherever. So no one was doing this because the whole idea about wine is like, you know, when you think about a wine making region, no one's thinking about Brooklyn at all. I mean, it, 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 it seems like an odd idea, but he knows all about wine and he thought that this was possible. So it seems like a bit of a crazy idea because he was saying, why not Brooklyn? right? And tapping into this made in Brooklyn because everything is made in Brooklyn and everything everything made in Brooklyn has this aura of coolness around it. And he wanted to kind of bring that to wine. So anyway, he basically launched this business while he was still a student. He partnered with his, his school and um, with uh, other, other wineries and vineyards in the area. He developed relationships in the Finger Lakes with some of those wineries up there and partnered with his school and managed to, to launch Rooftop Reds while he was at, like I said, while he was still a student. And then the story basically talks about some of the trials and tribulations that he had, you know, while some of the challenges he faced raising money, finding space, getting people to actually believe in this crazy idea, him testing the idea, and him actually securing a space, which was actually at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is in this picture that you're looking at, and also the way he found the space and actually secured funding. So that's basically what the story is about. And so you basically, towards the end, you see that he launched this space, and, I, and it's going to take four years to go from grape 
to wine. And he his plan was to sell one, each bottle for $1,000 a bottle, which is an amazing amount of money for a bottle of wine. But the idea that is that it would be, it'll appeal to collectors, not to people who want to pay, you know, $30 max for a bottle of wine like myself. No, he was going after the collectors. So, but anyway, that was the story. I mean, it had a lot of different components that made it very desirable when I pitched it because you have something very unusual happening in Brooklyn, something that almost seems like a bit of a no-brainer. You have this high price tag. You have this entrepreneur, this, this go-getter with this wild vision that made it all very compelling. So with that story in mind, let's kind of review what storytelling is. And you can kind of see how this story had a lot of components that makes a, a story a good story. So obviously you have your beginning, middle and end because obviously he starts as a student, he goes through his trials and tribulations. And at the end, voila, he has his uh, rooftop vineyard right there in, Brooklyn, in the heart of Brooklyn growing grapes at the time. Um, so I've given you, um, providing you a lot of facts and information in this narrative. And the idea, a good story should also motivate your reader. So you have to think about where this story is going to be. So this story was on CNBC.com and CNBC.com is very much targeted towards um, business leaders, business entrepreneurs. So you know the people who are reading CNBC.com or either business people or entrepreneurs or people who desire to be entrepreneurs or business people or really come in there for business inspiration. So my story needed to appeal to that audience. At the same time, from the brand, from, from Devin's standpoint, Rooftop Reds, you know, he needs to craft his own story to kind of motivate people who are in Brooklyn or people outside of Brooklyn or people who love Brooklyn, get them curious about wine. So you need to love Brooklyn and you need to love wine. And that, that way you'll be attracted to his brand of Rooftop Reds, right? So there's motivation from him as a brand, but motivation from me as a writer to kind of make this story compelling to my, my CNBC audience. And then from a brand storytelling standpoint, if you're a brand, your story should always be about your customers, but also reflect whatever your brand values are, should be incorporated into that. So any story that Devin is telling about rooftop reds should really kind of be about, you know, people who drink wine, right? Making wine more accessible, you know, building that story of urban or agriculture, which is kind of where his sweet spot was. Um, it's kind of like he's appealing to people, trying to expand people's vision of what they think of as a wine growing region. Like it's just not in Sonoma, you know, it's not just, you know, in France, it's, it could be right here in Brooklyn. So that is, and that's reflected in his brand of rooftop reds because it's right there on the roof drinking red. So he's kind of captured all of that. So a good story will have a lot of these components to it. And so that was, um, so, and brand storytelling has a lot of the same elements, but some of them have a bit of a twist. So why does storytelling, why does storytelling work? And I wanted to kind of give you this quote, which I find kind of fascinating, that stories are up to 22 times more memorable than facts and figures. People love stories. It's just that simple. Um, and in order to, if I sat here and just gave you a bunch of data, and a lot of times if you're in a class, certainly not Dr. Weaver's class, but in other classes <laughs> that just kind of bombard you with facts and figures and data, a lot of times your mind just kind of glazes over that information and you don't really um, retain a lot of it. But when someone tells you a story, you tend to remember it. And there's actually research around why stories are so powerful and so memorable because, because when you hear a story, it actually stimulates different parts of your brain um, versus just hearing facts and figures. So this whole idea is like when you hear a story, you actually experience it. So just think about the last time you read a really good book and you kind of get so involved in the story. You may cry, you know, you're sad because this uh, main character is going through something really difficult. You know, you, you just kind of experience that book as you're reading it, and a lot of times you'll experience a story as someone's telling it to you. So, you know, you, your heart may skip a beat, your palms may get sweaty, you, brink, you may blink 
blink a lot faster. Like these things actually happen um, when you hear a story. There's data to kind of support that. And so, so, if, so for example, if I tell you a story about how I dropped my phone on the floor and it was and it crashed to the floor really loudly, like you can actually see that phone falling. You can hear it because I'm telling you it crashed loud and then it broke. You can actually see everything that I'm telling you. And me telling you those things actually just stimulates different parts of your mind that makes that that experience more memorable, what I'm telling you more memorable. So I think that, um, so stories have that ability to just transport you to like a different place and just kind of have a much more long lasting impact on, on people who hear these stories. And so ultimately brand storytelling is powerful because as a brand, you know, all of you are entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs, you need to understand the power of brand storytelling. And brand storytelling makes your brand memorable, right? You remember, um, you tell a great story, people will remember. Just think about um, like say that the old spice, you know, the man, what is it, the man who smells like a man or the man that men smell like, that campaign um, with the guy who went through all of these different experiences. Like, I remember that. I think most of you, that was an extremely successful campaign and it brought Old Spice to life um, in a way that attracted, made it seem fun, young, hip, you know, and appealed to a completely different group. Like, I can't even sit here and think of another deodorant brand that, uh, like kind of captures the imagination in the way that Old Spice, that Old Spice campaign did. So you remember it, like, you know, so whereas before you wouldn't really be thinking about Old Spice as a memorable brand, that campaign and that story makes it memorable. And also a good story will humanize your brand. Cause like I said, that particular story, that, that, that Old Spice campaign, you remember that guy, you remember all of the different antics. It just kind of make Old Spice feels like a person all of a sudden. He's telling you, you know, putting you in different different uh, categories or different scenarios and it's funny, he's personable. And all of a sudden you're starting to think like Old Spice doesn't seem so old anymore, right? You're starting to kind of consider it again. It's making, you know, people kind of think, really think about it. And um, a, a good brand story can also kind of give you a competitive advantage because a lot of times other brands are not investing the time in creating a good story, right? So when you think about just keeping with the Old Spice example, other deodorant brands weren't doing that. So it's like, you know what? Old Spice starts to kind of stand apart from some of the other brands. And, um, and also too, I think one, one other thing about humanizing your brand, um, you know, if you think of brand as a, as a human, then you know what brands go, humans have ups and downs and challenges. And so brands can also have those same things, you know, so you could have your ups and downs and your challenges and you have a journey of your brand and you share the journey of your brand with your audience and take them along that journey with you. And that, and, and that helps um, connect your brand with its audience more deeply. Stories also show that you get your customer. You tell them the right story that resonates personally with them. It's like, you know, they understand me. You know, when you think about um, a brand that really kind of gets its customer, um, like REI, for example, like some of these outdoor brands, like they understand their North Face, you know, they are, they understand that their customers are adventurous, they're travelers, you know, they want, they, they're, they're the type of people who get out and do something. Like they understand their customer to the point where I think they were given their, their uh, employees you know, a day off of work, I, I believe it was during the holidays, like every year to go out and do something. That was the campaign. They want you to go out and experience the world because they understand this is what their customers do. Um, and stories also appeal, <laughs> this is my favorite, to irrational behavior. Because we all like to think that we're really rational and we make decisions based on facts, figures, just because I need this then for these ex exact reasons. But that's not actually the case. We're all pretty irrational. But if a brand tell, I mean, at the end of the day, do we really need the next iPhone <laughs> that comes out, iPhone 22? Do, do any of us need that? Do any of us need like the third car? We already have one car and two cars and now you're getting a third car. You know, a lot of times we're making these decisions. These are emotional decisions that we make. And stories appeal to emotions, right? So um, so if you're a brand and you have a good brand story, you're appealing to your emotions, then you can convince me that I actually need 
that next iPhone, you know, iPhone 12 or whatever version is up to now. I need that. You know why? Because I'm the type of person that goes out and buys iPhone 12 because I'm tech savvy. I'm hip. I'm cool. Like, you know, Apple has created this story that I have bought into and now I need to stand in line to get this product. That's because of the story that they're telling me that I connect to. And that's really a, the power of brand storytelling. So before I continue, I just want to make see if anybody has any kind of questions or comments on where we are so far. I was going to say that, um, like, I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but there's been times when I've been out and I'm at Target and I'm hungry. I'm like, I'll just grab a Snickers. Like, why wait? Like, you know, like it literally <laughs> happens. I'm like, I'm Snickers is going to fill me. So <laughs> I'm just going to eat the Snickers. Exactly. You start to remember these things and, you know, in your head, because you hear it over and over and over again, and you start to kind of believe it and you repeat it to yourself and you embrace it. And that's really the power. It's the power of uh, storytelling, but it's also the power of repetition, you know, that it kind of gets seeped into your head. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a powerful tool to kind of use. And it's really important for entrepreneurs because it's really a way to kind of stand out. Um, from all of the noise that's out there. Also, um, in the beginning, I accidentally called this class entrepreneurship and innovation class. It's a social entrepreneurship class. Um, and what's storytelling is so powerful in social entrepreneurship because when you're literally talking about the social problem that you're trying to address, that's a story. That's a story that you want to connect with people's hearts so that they can um, not only um, use your business once, but tell that story to then other people that will then um, learn about your business and want to explore it and maybe have the same kind of passion behind that problem that you have. So storytelling is very, very important in social entrepreneurship. Yes. And I did not share this uh, deck with uh, Dr. Weaver in, in advance, but it sounds like I did because my very next slide is all about brands with great stories and understanding that this class is about social entrepreneurship. I included um, brands that kind of reflect that because some of the some of the best stories are told by uh, brands with a social mission connected to it. So the first brand is Nike. I think any student of uh, marketing and branding and anyone who wants to kind of understand the, the power of um, brand storytelling. Nike, hands down, is a master at this. Um, There's so many great campaigns that they've kind of gone, they've, they've had over the years that really um, reinforce who they are as a brand and really kind of connect deeply with their audience. I mean, Nike, at, at the end of the day, is a brand, is about, you know, empowerment, being a maverick. Um, with this Colin Patrick, with this particular campaign, it was about defiance, you know, about bravery. And, and they took a huge risk with this campaign that ultimately paid off for them financially. It reinforced who they are. And only a brand like Nike, who's very connected with their mission and with their audience can take this kind of risk with their brand, because it was in fact a risk, but nevertheless, it was, a, it was consistent and authentic to who they are as a company. And I think that that's important to, un to understand. There are other brands who, who, who could have done that and it would feel very inauthentic. And you're like, what on earth are they doing? But this is consistent with just do it because this is, this is who they are and they wanted to connect to their audience in a very different sort of way. So I would say study any sort of campaign from Nike, not just this one, but they've had so many great um, so many great campaigns over the years from a brand storytelling standpoint. Um, another brand that with a great story, of course, Tom Shoes. I mean, I'm, I'm, you probably have maybe studied this already in your class, you know, but Tom Shoes, you know, they're, they say they're in business to improve lives. I mean, that's an incredible mission. And the founder, you know, has an amazing story that he tells, you know, in terms of being in, you know, finding these shoes or being inspired by his trip to Argentina. And then, um, inventing this one for one model where you buy one shoes and you donate a pair of shoes to people to, to kids in need in countries I believe in Argentina I think that's I, well and at this point it's all around the world he's donating you know shoes to people who don't have shoes around the world that is a powerful story that people who um want to help I mean we're in a point where now people want to help other people around the world is heightening the uh, problem, you know, and I think now he has a campaign 
where you don't wear shoes for a day. It's like you don't wear shoes for, to highlight the um, issue of people who don't have shoes and all of the things, the disease, the blisters and all of those problems that, that uh, people have that don't have shoes, right? So he's very deeply connected to his mission and his brand story is a very powerful one that people connect to. And, that, and it has allowed that company to kind of grow until like, I, I don't know, last count, it might, it, it's, close to almost a billion dollar company, but I think it was like at 750 million, the last in sales, the last time I checked. So it's been a very successful, um, and he basically sold his story, helped him sell his shoes because he didn't even have a career in the fashion. He, he wasn't even connected to the apparel industry when he started this. So it just tells you the power of a story and getting people to believe in you could take you a very, very long way. And then Warby Parker has also another, the founder's story is fantastic, you know, um, about being, you know, these guys were, he lost his glasses on a backpacking trip, you know, and I guess during his first semester in grad school, he didn't have enough money to buy a pair of glasses. So the whole idea is why are glasses so expensive? The problem is glasses are too expensive. So he wanted to create designer glasses that were more affordable. That's, that's how Warby Parker started. And I, and I think what's also interesting about Warby Parker, again, it has a social enterprise, you know, angle as well to it, where they also kind of donate um, a pair of glasses. When people buy a pair of glasses, they also donate that. So, and that whole model was obviously invented, you know, through Tom's Shoes and a lot of different companies have kind of embraced that. So I think, you know, as you start to kind of think about your brand story, you will take inspiration from, from these companies and how they kind of found their brand story and how they kind of use that to help get their audience to kind of really believe in them and champion them and share their stories, you know, with others. So, so which leads me to finding your own story. So how do you guys find your stories um, as an entrepreneur? And so the first thing you have to do is Def, you know, define your brand. And what that pretty much means is why do you do what you do? And why do you do what you do is actually more important than um, what you do to some extent, because the why of what you do is your, is, is the fundamental component of your story, because that's what people connect to. It's like, I could go buy shoes from, you know, you know, how many different shoe companies are there? There's so many different shoe companies. Why do I buy Tom's shoes? I like Tom's shoes. Well, the shoes are cute, but you can find cute shoes. But not only are the shoes cute, now I'm helping someone else who doesn't, who don't have a pair of shoes. I'm now I'm connecting to his story because his story is about to improve, to improve lives around the world. I want to do that. That sounds freaking awesome, right? So why do you do what you do? You know, why does your business exist? Why are you offering? What are you offering? And how is it different? Why should consumers even care about your business or your brand? What do you stand for? And what do your customers need? So as you think about defining your brand, those are some of the questions you should be asking yourself to help kind of get closer to your story. So for example, you know, when I was at CNBC, you know, we had, um, I worked for CNBC primetime, which is the, you know, CNBC during a day is all um, business news, stock markets. And we wanted to create a brand at night with entertainment reality TV shows. And so the focus would be on money. So as we were trying to think about building this brand from scratch, we kind of had to ask ourselves, why are we doing this? You know, what is ultimately our mission and what do we bring different to the table? And where we kind of net it out in terms of defining our brand is that CNBC overall is about money, you know, but during the day we're about, you know, CEOs and executives and, and Wall Street. So we were about Wall Street during the day. And then we said at night, we're about Main Street and um, helping small businesses and entrepreneurs and, and shows that were really um, target this particular group and people who aspire to be entrepreneurs. So not your executive, not your CEOs that watch during the day, but it was a very different audience, you know, at night because we felt like we wanted to help them, these, these guys make money. And, and so then the second, so the second step 
once you understand why you do what you do and you've kind of really gotten clear about um, your brand's objectives and why you're why you're in this business, whatever business that is, you need to understand your customer. I mean, this is super critical. Um, wh what is your customer? Um, what are their fears? What are their hopes? What are their dreams? What motivates them? What do they value? Um, what's the larger benefit that you're offering them? You know, if I'm in makeup, you know, I yes, maybe I lipstick. Now my lips can be different colors, but the larger benefit, you're selling beauty. You can make someone feel younger, you know, more beautiful, more confident, like those higher benefits that your that your um, brand is providing because you know, there's probably 20,000 different lipstick companies at, at this point of beauty companies. Like, but, but why you? What are you doing that's different? Why? So you have to understand your customer. Customer research is critical. It's critical, critical, critical. So and understanding everything that you can about your customer. So back to CNBC, once we understood, you know, we define our brand, we are CNBC, we're at night, we're about money and small business and entrepreneurs, then I needed to really understand, we need to understand as a brand, you know, all these things that I'm telling you, you know, what makes small businesses tick, what make these entrepreneurs tick. And we kind of start to understand, not only what were we in the business of, uh, we need to understand the customers of entrepreneurs, small business, but we needed to understand people who aspire to be these same people. Right, because we needed to understand like some of their hopes and dreams of why they haven't kind of take taken a leap into entrepreneurship and talk to them in a way that that recognizes them and 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 honors their journey and gets them to also kind of tune in and watch the NBC. Um so and then the third thing you need to do is try and find your hook. And your hook is going to be the overlap between what makes your brand different and what your customers wants, wants and needs are, right? So that's, so, so it's a sweet spot in between those two and trying to find your hook. And what I would say for CNBC Prime, one, of the, one hook that we found is that, um, you know, we knew we had the, the talent that we had were really successful um, entrepreneurs or businessmen who would run the shows, who were the hosts. And we knew that we were, you know, targeting small businesses and entrepreneurs, you know, but one hook that we kind of found is our host would spend their own money, right? You know, we have the prophet Marcus Lemonis. He's a very successful entrepreneur, but now he's going to spend his own money to kind of and invest in these different companies and help them. Shark Tank, you know, we have, the, the, you know, we have all of, you know, the hosts, Barbara, Barbara Cocker and Kevin O'Leary, all of those guys, they actually have stake in the game. You know, they invest their own money in these different businesses. So we kind of saw that as a hook in order to add legitimacy, you know, to our programming, because, you know, these these entrepreneurs, these our hosts don't just talk the talk, they walk the walk, they're coming up out of their pocket, and they're, you know, helping these entrepreneurs. So that was our hook, but you have to find, you know, whatever your hook is. So that way that really makes you stand out. And, um, and I think, authenticity was, you know, was also part of our hook, but finding your hook. So looking at defining your brand and understanding your customer and doing those two and your hook is somewhere in the middle of those. So telling your story. So what are some of the steps to telling your story? So first you have to figure out what, identify your core message. Are you selling a product? Are you, you know, raising money? Are you advocating for a cause? Like, you know, what exactly are you doing? And you need to be able to articulate that briefly, right? So, um, so yeah, be clear about what you're actually doing, right? And then as you start to tell your story, understand that there's components of a story. So, you know, you have your character, your conflict, and then your resolution. So a lot of times your conflict is whatever problem you're solving, right? What is that problem and what is that resolution? 
And um, so the, those components are always kind of there. Even when you go back to the Old Spice com commercial, um, you have that main character and it, his, his problem was, you know, feeling fresh and being ready for all these different activities, you know, quickly. And the resolution was Old Spice, you know, is there for him, you know? So that was kind of the way that story always kind of played out. And, um, and then you have, yeah, right, make, make it obviously making your story entertaining, memorable, universal. That's, you know, of course, right? Like Old Spice, that, that was a very funny commercial and people talked about it. And it's actually one of the best in class examples of being really funny and memorable. And it actually, you know, make, makes, makes women consider, you know, buying freaking Old Spice for, for their partner because why not, right? And, um, and also to, Enough. The final step is making sure you have your call to action. What do you want your audience to do after they hear your story? Do you want them to donate? Do you want them to subscribe to, to your newsletter? Do you want them to buy something from you? In my case, I wanted them to watch a television show. So it's always really clear at the end, you know, tune in, you know, Sunday at eight o'clock, you know, if, if it was a, a commercial, but there were times when I wanted them to go online, you know, and, and uh, sign up for my newsletter, you know, I wanted them to kind of enter a sweepstakes that I was doing is all you have to always be clear once you tell that story, what is the what do you need that cu your customer to do? Don't just leave them hanging. Any questions? We're doing okay. Okay, good. And so, um, and so, so I'll give you a few thought starters in terms of how thinking about things that you for your for your brand story. So, as I so as we talked about earlier, it could be your founder's story. You know, why are you creating this? What problem or, or did you set out to solve? You know, like you know, Tom was you know trekking out in Argentina and had this idea you know, and um, around these shoes and then paired that with helping kids who didn't have shoes. That was his story. You know, what, what is motivating you to, to launch your product or your service? There could be a story in that. Um, talk about the time you help one of your customers. Is there some outstanding story where you went above and beyond to kind of help a customer? You could tell that story. Um, but you can also talk about the people creating your product. You know, that kind of goes to a lot of the fair trade stories. A lot of times the coffee, you know, a lot of coffee companies now are talking about the people who roast their coffee, the farmers in, you know, wherever, Uganda or wherever they may be in these coffee producing regions, they will talk about them. Um, and so that's, there could be stories there. So you have to just think about all of these different places that you may, that, their natural places, the stories being created. You can also, if you have an audience, if you have a social media following around your, yourself or your product, ask them for their stories because within their stories, you, you can find your story, right? Ask them about how they use your product, what they like about your product, some of the unusual things maybe they've like done with their product or where their, your product saved the day or your service saved the day. And within that could be your brand story. It could help inspire you. Also, um, start looking at other people's brand stories, right? And maybe keep a collection of some of those brand stories and use that for inspiration as you start to kind of ideate about your brand story. What brand stories kind of connect to you and use that for further inspiration. And so finally, making the media work for you. So you have your story. Now, how do you, you have your product, you have your story, now you're ready to get it out into the world. So now what? So how to get media attention. So the first thing to do to get media attention is a one way is through a press release. Now that probably sounds easier said than done, but the key with a press release is you need a newsworthy event. So what is your newsworthy event? Can you create a newsworthy event? Um, like you could have, you just launched, that could be newsworthy. You just got a funding round, that could be newsworthy. Um, or you could come up with some other creative stunt that, you know, I'll show an example after I kind of go through these, go through this. But nevertheless, like you have to try and figure out how can you generate news that can go into some sort of press release. 
The second way you can get media attention is to get to know a journalist. Now, I know this is definitely easier said than done because as a former journalist, having taken pictures from people, I know how difficult that can be. But I think the ways which you can do in order to get to know the journalist is A, you need to get to know them. You know, you you know their beat, you know their angle, you should follow them on social media and really try and start to be a resource. So if I'm in a technology space, then I should know the technology. I should be aware of and, and hunt down the technology writer for the New York Times, for Wired, you know, the Wall Street Journal, like, you know, whatever, like all of these different places, get to know who these people are, right? And then follow them and understand who are, the, who are most likely to be attracted to your product, right? So, because a lot of times what happens is people will try and pitch a journalist not understanding what they cover. If I cover, you know, economics or if I cover housing, real estate, you know, and you're coming with me at something that has nothing to do with real estate or some sort of education product that has nothing to do with my beat, you're basically just wasting my time. And you can't expect that person that you've reached out to who's covering real estate to go find the education person for you. That's your job, right? So you have to kind of do the work of locating the journalist that's going to be more receptive to your story <coughs> and your product and service. So you just have to do the work. And I think, and once you do that, what you have to do is really try and position yourself as an expert and be a resource for that journalist. So, cause you know what they're covering. If you know that they're covering education, you have an education product and then it's something that happens in the news, you can be that resource that they call because they know that you are an education expert. Um, the, third, the third way to get media attention, I really, really like this is um, create research. And the way that you do this is you, if you, you become an expert in your industry, right? And you start to kind of create, you know, facts and figures about your industry, right? And you publish that and you update that because ultimately journalists are always looking for information and, you know, story breaks, you know, now, or I'm trying to put a story together, again, about education. I'm always looking for facts and figures. It could be a story that I'm doing on education, you know, in New York, right? So now what are the latest research reports about students in New York, education in New York, funding in New York related to education? But it, so imagine if you have an education product and you're creating some of these documents that I'm ultimately going to be looking for then I'm seeing you as an expert. So the person who kind of used this kind of brilliantly was Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank, the real estate guru. And, you know, she created, the, when she was starting out, she created um, the Cochrane Report where she was basically compiled facts and figures around New York real estate. So now you're doing a story about New York real estate now, and she has this report and you're reporting, you're like looking for information and she's compiled all this information that you need then. And you're like, wow, this is some great information. Next thing you know, when you need somebody on air, you're calling her because you, you're, you're reading her reports. It's very useful. She's clearly an expert in her field and what she's doing, you know, and that's another way to kind of, you know, get get the media to kind of pay attention to you because there's another way of you showing your expertise and being a resource for the media. And then the last way to get a media and well, the fourth way that I'm illustrating is Newsjack. And that's a way of kind of insert, riding the breaking news wave and somehow inserting your company into that you know, where, you know, something is happening in, in the world and you're like, wait, you have a unique angle and you're able to kind of insert yourself into that story in that brief time when news is breaking and journalists are trying to find either another angle or a fresh angle or another voice and you're that person. So I'll, I'll show some examples. So in, in terms of stunting, so one idea in terms of getting coverage in a press release. So I worked on um, one of the shows at CNBC was called The Job Interview. And it was um, a series about people going on job interviews. And it was a universal experience. We all have gone on job interviews before. 
And so the stunt, but in order to get people to really pay attention, to generate more media coverage around this particular show, we held a stunt in Rockefeller Center where we put people in this glass box and we conducted real interviews. Um, we had companies conduct real interviews in this glass box in order to promote this show. And so as you can imagine, it was quite a spectacle, right? Because you have in the middle of New York City, Rockefeller Center, and all of a sudden this box goes up. People, of course, are in line, like looking into the box. Meanwhile, you have someone who's really serious about doing this interview, trying to concentrate. And it listen, it, it accomplished its goal in terms of several outlets covered it because it was very unusual. It's like, wait a second, what, what is CNBC doing? Why do they have people interviewing for a job inside of a glass box? You know, I mean, in this particular um, ad, they're saying uncomfortable promo. Yeah, of course. I mean, but that was the point. So you may not be able to have the resources, obviously, to do something like this as a, as a startup entrepreneur. But the idea is, you know, do something kind of out of the ordinary or unexpected that the media will want to cover. Right. We figured that this was going to be so out of the ordinary that we probably would get media coverage for it. So that's the idea of doing something that would create that would generate a press release and get people interested, specifically the media. And being an expert, you know, being a resource for journalists. So another show that I worked on at CNBC was called Listing, Listing Impossible. And one of the and it was all about high price real estate, uh, specifically in California. And this person here, he was the star of the show. His name was Aaron Kerman, and he you know, sold a ton of real estate over the course of his life. He was a superstar real estate agent. And so the idea was, how can we continue to promote the show and Aaron um, beyond just you know, regular TV, you know, TV commercials? And so one way is you know, what I was saying before, become, you know, become an expert. He's an expert on real estate. So there was an opportunity when we're talking about real estate on our air, specifically during the coronavirus and the effect that we have on real estate. It's like, let's get Aaron on because Aaron has expertise in this field and we had him on our air. And, and granted, it was easy because it's a CNBC show and uh, he was on CNBC during the day on a new show, but it actually isn't as easy as it seems because just because someone is, on at night on entertainment during the day it's, it's about serious news so we had to position him you know as an expert in real estate which he was and that was using his his real estate expertise to get more exposure for him and his and the, the tv show during the day by him talking about something that was relevant and that was always also in his bill box as a real estate agent And then News Jack. So hopefully you all are remember that Peloton ad that ran last last year, where Peloton, um, where the husband bought the wife uh, a Peloton for Christmas, and it was. And then I think a year later, she's like, "Oh, I, I really needed this, or whatever the case may be." Anyway, Peloton. I think they lost almost a billion dollars in value as a result of that ad because it was so much negative publicity around it and people said it was sexist and it was just, you know, a horrible ad for so many different reasons. So there was a lot of news around this Peloton ad at the time, you know, but what one person did, um, an actor, a gin company, you know, they hired that same woman, uh, Monica Ruiz, and did a, a ad for um, Jen, where she was kind of basically sitting there with her girlfriends and selling Jen, you know, kind of basically upset about the kind of ad, although they never mentioned Peloton. And, you know, and the girlfriends are like, girl, you still look good or you look really good or whatever. But it was a really, but it was a way of the Jen company news jacking, right? That's an example. So you have this Peloton ad getting all of this negative publicity. And, and what did he do to Shin Company? They immediately is like, let's call this actress. Let's get her to do a response ad and sell our gin. And so her, so the gin became like, you know, throwing back one, you know, of course, you know, when people get upset, they may drink some alcohol to kind of calm down, go out with their friends or what have you. And that was kind of like their take. It's like, and they kind of did a tongue in cheek, like, you know, talking how she looked good. So that's the idea of taking advantage of news. Another example of, of news jacking is 
when Harry and Meghan um, announced that they were leaving, um, stepping back as uh, as royals, right? Uh, what was the the company, the Wax Museum, well, oh, Madame Trussaud in New York, and I think actually in London, they kind of decided they took down Meghan and Harry from the Wax Museum. They removed them as part of the royal family, but that was their way of inserting themselves into um, the news cycle because everybody was talking about Meghan and Harry stepping away from the royals and Madame Tussaud, like, okay, let me pull them out. We're taking them out of the wax museum. And now that's another story that we're gonna talk about. Now we're talking about Madame Tussaud because of what they did. So that's, again, that's another example of news shacking. And so, and that's it. So that's, you know, that's kind of the conclusion to uh, the presentation. And, you know, ultimately, hopefully the big takeaway here is that stories help brands stand out. And so it's extremely important as an entrepreneur that you kind of utilize the power of storytelling as part of your brand. And so, and hopefully I've given you some food for thought as you kind of think about your own story. Okay, so, so, all right. Virtual round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank very, you. Informative. very informative. Um, questions for our eTalk speaker. Did that glass door interview really happen or was that Photoshop? Because I've, I've been going on many interviews and I hope they don't do that to me. <laughs> Yeah, no, actually it was real. I mean, it was it it was a live interview. We found some smaller companies that were willing to do it. People had to sign releases, but they were actually live interviews. I mean, I, I can't imagine anyone doing something like that. You know, again, I mean, it was a stunt, but they were really live interviews. Because if it was fake, then that would take away the, the news value of it. It almost had to be real, right? Because why would the media cover it if it's fake? If it's just everyone's an actor, then that's not newsworthy. Um, I have a question too. Well, thank you for joining us today. I really enjoyed your talk. <laughs> um, I wanted to know, but going off of the glass um, door thing, my question was like, how do you, because I'm not sure if like you said or if I missed it, um, like how do you kind of like guarantee, and I'm not sure if the word is guarantee, but like that the media would like know that your whatever you're doing is happening like do you tell them like beforehand or like do you just hope that it's big enough and then they see you yes no you do tell them you notify them in advance so that's really the role of of your public relations department so what they'll do is kind of notify all of their contacts in media about this is what's happening. This is what we're doing. This is what is happening. And the idea is hopefully they take interest in it. And so, and if you guys had something that when I was saying it might be your launch story, your funding story, or just whatever kind of story that you guys have, you can submit it. This is PR, like PR Wire is one company where you can kind of submit your um, press release and then they'll upload it and send it around to different organizations. And if someone's interested, then they would reach out to you or they may put it in their publication or what have you. But yeah, there's definitely a PR firm will let people know once you do a press release about it, because we did a press release where we had this idea, we let our public relations team know, they draft a press release and send it out. And then you, and then they'll usually, if someone's really interested, they'll contact the PR person to say, oh, to get more details and, and they'll let us know that they're coming. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Note, so Cheyenne and I just did a press release for Iona for, about this class. And um, it went out yesterday. I'm not sure if you saw, I can actually email it to all of you. But one thing that happened as a result of the uh, press release, like I have a ton of emails from people in the social enterprise sector now contacting me because they saw the press release. And so, and the press release was just about launching this new class and helping the Westchester community. Yeah, but for you all, we have a public relations team and I know that like Kobe, for instance, has a business. So if you have businesses, that's a press release right there. You know, um, Joey, you have your social media influencer, your video went viral. That's a press release right there. Those are opportunities. Um, Rihanna and Cheyenne, I know that you guys are always doing research. You're doing the fact that you did research and presented at this conference and you're going to be presenting in Spain, that's a press release right there. And congratulations, that sounds amazing.
<laughs> uh, more questions for I guess. I thought your, your talk was phenomenal. And I thought it was incredibly useful, especially like the storytelling action steps and getting media attention. So, so useful and um, incredibly useful for every single person in this class. And I just hope that you realize the knowledge that you just received. It's like golden nuggets. Well, and that's good. And I, and like I said, I really tried to pick examples that you guys could relate to, which is, which is what a marketer should do and what you guys have to do as well, right? Because there's so many stories that I could tell, you know, but I specifically chose that story about the rooftop wine because he did this while he was in school. So he's like you guys. And it would be great for you guys to all kind of read stories like that because that's what inspires you and keeps you going and lets you know that whatever it is you really want to do, you can, you know, you can do it and have great success with it. Awesome. More questions or even comments? Or anything that you guys are even working on that maybe you'd like to get Renee's feedback on? possible stories that you'd like to tell. This is more like a comment. I was just gonna say that um, it was a really good talk. It was, it's nice to um, see, like the story was very inspiring for me because um, I think for all of us, like we're all either trying to start businesses or like thinking about it. And so just seeing like a student that started theirs in school and even the fact that like his school invested in it was really nice to hear. Mm -hmm. yeah. selling wine for a thousand dollars yeah you know it's funny i was trying to figure out if he in fact sold the wine because his wine should have matured um like in 2019 2020 or sometime last year so i could i was trying to google before this to see if he actually sold any for a thousand dollars so i have to find out but that even the idea of that is bold <laughs> it is it is so I think that, you know, it's also too, as you, as from, from an entrepreneur standpoint, you know, rooftops are hot, right? You know, you have, there's so many things happening on rooftops. And so the, so the way that he could, because obviously it was going to take four years for him to get to a, a bottle of wine over those four years. How do you make money? You know, mm -hmm. so he started looking at what other rooftops were doing and he started having events, mm -hmm. you know, food events, food and wine events. He got wine from upstate New York because he has a partnership with the Finger Lakes and came up with a very, um, and then you have this beautiful rooftop with views of Brooklyn and Manhattan. So he kind of looked at what other people with rooftop businesses were doing and copied them while his grapes matured. So that way he could still make quite a bit of money. So it was like thinking about his revenue model, like, okay, what are all these different ways I can make money on a rooftop in New York City? So you, so even though you have that one long, your, your one vision, you can kind of have different ways of kind of thinking about it and figure out other ways to kind of drive value. Yeah. And it doesn't all have to be complete at once. No, it does not. And take your, you know, the part of your story is literally taking your consumers on a journey with you. Yes. Nowadays. And test and testing too, because I know, you know, Dr. Weaver is probably really clear about, you know, test and learn, test and learn, test and learn. He didn't just start out, you know, on this rooftop. I mean, he had to test his idea. He tested his idea um, on like the a fire escape, one of his friends outdoor fire escape, just to kind of see how would grapes, um, would these grapes survive a New York winter? Wow. So that was and, and only once he saw that they survived was he said, okay, I could scale this up. And he took that information, his test to, that was part of his pitch to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, you know, like this will work because it sounds like a crazy idea. And it's like, how do you know this is going to work, you know? And so, because he tested it and learned from that, and then he was able to kind of scale it up. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good story. And if anybody's in, 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 in New York City, yeah, I, he's open for business. I'll send I'll send you the link, um, Dr. Weaver, and you can share it with the students. Okay, awesome. What comments, questions? So you've all done impact um, statements, your hustle statements, um, and which is basically like related to your story. So um, you have some. If you want to share that, how do you present that to the world? How do you brand yourself with that? And um, you know, you have an expert here. <laughs> I would love to hear a few impact statements. Um, I can go just because I have mine written on my laptop, so I have it open. 
um, when we did this assignment, um, I said for mine, I said the passion within me is what is driving me. Like I have been inspired. I want people of color to see the flame within themselves and ignite it. I am a leader, I am empathetic, and I'm committed to helping others discover their passions by building spaces and communities. I am a force to be reckoned with. I will use my talents and gifts to spread hope, inspiration, and courage. Awesome. Nice. Yes, that sounds fantastic. What kind of business are you are you starting? Um, so I actually I co-founded one over the summer, which basically highlights um people of color in more positive ways through like media production. So if it's like short films or like photo series and stuff. Mm -hmm. But my one true like kind of like what I really want to do and I started working on it already was basically just a way to like give people of color the tools that they need to start their own businesses that are that live in like unfortunate in like underprivileged areas and stuff. Fantastic. Nice job. Thank you. He's a photographer too. Oh, nice. So I was thinking about that with the storytelling. Photography is a form of storytelling. Yes, definitely. Oh, that's the visual storytelling. Yeah, you could tell great stories. I guess, what would be your initial advice to young entrepreneurs that are just trying to put, get themselves out there or even to social media influencers, for example? Um, what what would help them stand out on the crowd? Um, what would help you stand out from the crowd? Um, I mean, I honestly, I think it honestly still comes back to a powerful story. I mean, you have to really connect so well to your story and let your passion um, shine through, right? And I think that, is it Rihanna? We just Rihanna, yeah. Rihanna, okay. You know, I heard the passion there, right? So and then you just have to like dig deeper to find like that story. So maybe there's a story. I mean, obviously I don't know what your story is, but like if there was a story of, you know, some struggle, some pain, or you know, maybe your mother tried to be an entrepreneur and she didn't make it and it was always her dream and that was your dream and you know or maybe there's some, some stories of like rejection or watching a cousin you know succeed like you know what is that that's driving you right and I think it's like what because it has there's something that's driving you like again if you're going to go back to um Tom you know Tom's shoes I mean he was kind of saw these shoes and he paired it with a cause and that drove him to he wants to try and improve the world he was just kind of somehow driven to make a difference in terms of these shoes right like he was going to use shoes as, as his vehicle and he was just kind of driven because by what he saw and it was authentic and people connected to it and I think that you have to be willing um, to be vulnerable and you can't be afraid to share your story, right? Even not thinking that, you know, you can't shine it up and put all the bells and whistles on it by thinking that, because if it's too shiny, people will think it's not authentic. So I think that you, I think it's important just to really, you know, when I said, um, you know, why do you do what you do? You really have to get crystal clear about that and find the emotion that's there because people connect with emotion. You know, are you, is your story going to make me laugh? Is it going to make me cry? Is it going to make me um, feel hopeful? You know, what is your story? Going, how is your story going to make me feel? How, and you know, ultimately, how is your product going to make me feel? I think the most important thing to remember is when you're being vulnerable and telling your story, whatever your story is, is that you're trying to relate to people. Yes. They want, they need you to relate to them and connect with them on a deep human level. And so sometimes people are afraid of being vulnerable, but that vulnerability is what gives you relation. It's like, oh, you're going through that? Well, I'm going through that too. And like, you know, and it's, and whatever your story is, there's someone else out there that connects with it. Yes, because, and then like, even when um, there was this brand that uh, I came across, it's these two fathers who launched a company around, they wanna clean up medicine. So this whole idea of clean medicine. So when you think about what motivated them is they had, uh, they have daughter, kids. And whenever you give kids like aspirin or like certain medicines, if you ever really look at the medicines, sometimes they have coloring in it. Sometimes they have sugar. They, they have all these things that have nothing to do with medicine. And so their idea was to clean it up, 
you know, just like how people are cleaning up, you know, snacks and different food items, they've decided to try and tackle medicine. And so when I read that story, I don't have kids, but the whole idea of cleaning up medicine, I was like, I still take cough medicine and I still do I take aspirins or whatever I may take. And I was like, wait a second, that resonated so deeply with me because I was like, I'm that person that, that, you know, have cleaned up my diet. You know, I try and just eat fruits and vegetables and blah, blah, all of that stuff I try and do well. So, so this would, this fits into the story of who I am. I'm that person that would embrace this clean medicine right? Because that's just how I view myself. It's consistent with everything else that I do. And so that their mission connects with me. So I would actually buy their product without, you know, I would buy it. You put it on the shelf. Yes. Aspirin that's cleaned up versus aspirin not cleaned up. I'm buying a cleaned up, I'm buying a cleaned up one because that's my story. So connecting with people ultimately, and I connect with your story. They, even though I don't have kids, it doesn't matter because I connect with this whole idea of a bunch of crap being in a lot of foods that we eat and somebody needs to clean it up. And if these guys are doing it, then, then great for them. And I like that story. Yeah, awesome example. And that's an example of empathy mapping. <laughs> Any comments or questions before we have three minutes left? Thank you so much, Renee Brinkley. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. So insightful. Um, just thank you so much for um, joining us today. Yes, you're very, very welcome. And if at some point someone has questions, um, you can certainly like, yeah, Rashida can certainly contact. I mean, Dr. Weaver can certainly contact me, you know, with any of your questions. And um, I'm happy to like answer any other questions if you, if someone kind of comes up with something after we, after we talk or something comes up later. All right. All right. I want to wish all of you good luck with your, I hope to read about all of you in entrepreneur.com magazine or, you know, Inc or whatever. So I, I, I wish all of you much, much success.